you have a whole three generations here watching the current events what goes through your head have you been here before yes i've been here before um it's been different things with young african americans going on in our country over over time and so i've been here a personal experience you know as a younger adult and now what goes through my mind is just the other day like my grandson's walking to football practice i find myself in a relatively safe neighborhood but i find myself watching him all the way to the corner you know even though he knows how to interact but i still find myself being um babysitting them even though they both are 15 and 16 but still being protective of just to make sure they get where they're supposed to go Junior, how is it raising two young black boys in 2020? Um, it's different for sure. Um, my biggest issue is, is fear mostly because of the world that we live in. Um, but I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one talking with my son about the way the world is these days. And I make sure that he understands that um, I know he's a good person. I know he carries himself with integrity, but until you show that, you may be looked at as a threat until you show. And we have those conversations often to make sure that he always puts his best foot forward. So. Is it a concern of yours that your sons may be profiled or even targeted just because of the way they look, their skin color? Definitely. Um, we, we just recently moved out to a predominantly white neighborhood and you know, every time they go off to ride their bikes or anything like that, I find myself where it should just be, hey, go ahead and go ride, have fun. We have to have a conversation before they ride off about, you know, what if, because what if is happening these days. So we have that conversation often when they go to leave from around my care that, you know, you have to watch out for yourself. You have to be prepared if you are approached or profiled and how to respond. And we do a lot of um, self-esteem building and things like that to make sure that he understands who he is and that he can interact the right way. Romico, do you feel safe being a young black boy here in America? Um, I feel like we're always like looked at as a threat. I don't feel like we're um, really like, Like we're not looked at as like same as other people because like our color. I feel like we're judged like, like by our color and stuff. And I feel like it's not safe, not yet. How does that make you feel? I feel like uh, scared kind of, cause like you never know, it could be me. It could be anybody of my color. So yeah, it just makes me feel uncomfortable. Does it make you feel less than? Yeah, because um, I feel like we're judged every time we go out. And I feel like we don't, we like, I just feel like we get judged every time we get out. Yeah. Let's talk about the talk. Um, unfortunately, it's a conversation that is held in many black households across the U.S. Mm -hmm. How did that conversation start with you to Junior to now your offspring? Well, when my, I was probably more old school, kind of as I do, not as verbal as when Mike was, was growing up, but he went to Scott. And so a lot of the things that he was ingrained in him came because of that level of being at Scott and Afro, African American, he was involved in the Afro club and different things and had some, some great mentors outside outside of uh, me, more per se. So that probably one-on-one -on -one never really had to say, okay, Mike, go to talk, um, per se, mm -hmm. when, as we were growing up. It was kind of like he saw where, how I did kind of things. And I'm more of he, you know, I could tell some of my mannerisms he picked up, and a lot of me, he didn't, which is probably a good thing, because he's a, he's a great father. And so for, for me, it was kind of just saying, things, being in the struggle. He knew I was going to do things that were in the struggle. And so those kind of things. And so a lot of 
a lot of um, his come from being, I, I think, in, in Scott and being active in Afro Club and, and some of the mentors that were at Scott. And then on my perspective, just watching, you know, how I, how I went about doing what I did um, uh, as a golfer. He, he picked up golf when he was in high school and I played golf and stuff. And my dad and him come from a line of golfers that weren't do, allowed to do anything but caddy, but they were all African-American golfers and stuff. And so I kind of passed that on down and, and able to interact in some of those other areas where we weren't really allowed to or they didn't perceive us as, as golfers and things like that. So it's kind of more of a watching and seeing mm -hmm. and observing right. me. Yeah, um, yeah. to piggyback on that, yes, I did um, watch him a lot. And, and yeah, I am a lot like him. Um, I am soft-spoken. I like to think before I speak. But when I speak, I'm going to speak. You know, mm -hmm. it's one of those things. I, I feel like um, if, if we take a beat and then respond, you know, it'll be a much better outcome. And, yeah, I've, I've learned that over the years from him and definitely through my schooling and and things like that. I had a lot of mentors that I try to gravitate towards people that have a, a positive perspective and hope and, and a drive. That's the thing that I look for. So uh, yeah, I would say uh, I, I just watched him a lot coming up and I'm a lot like him right now. Did you have that race conversation with your sons? Yes. Um, yesterday, matter of fact, was another conversation. We went for a bike ride to Wildwood Park and we pulled off and you know, and I have two other daughters and a stepson as well. We pulled off and sat down and I talked to them for probably a good hour about, you know, where we live now and, and how they are perceived when they leave and what's going on in the world. We talked about, you know, um, generational wealth. We, we talked about a bunch of things because I want them to know that they have the same opportunity as right. anybody else at any given time and I just wanted them to try to focus their minds. I'm sure there'll be plenty more conversations, but yeah, we just yesterday had a, another one. So yeah, have it often. <laughs> Is this conversation a conversation that will end now or will it repeat itself in 20 years? Uh, it's, it's good to see some of the stuff happening. I don't think it's going to end in my gener generation. There's hope for as they come, they're more intertwined um, with different uh, diverse groups, even in their sports and things like that. So I think there's a chance for their generation. Mind, it's, it's going to be kind of like what it is now. Um, buckheads and hope for some legislation to change some stuff still buckheads because when you think about it, you got people in their 30s 40s 50s that grew up with this kind of systemic racism that we deal with a lot of people don't want to hear the word systemic but it is systemic and so to get that weeded out it's going to take a lot so it won't it, it will have some gradual improvements but it won't be eradicated in, in my lifetime we'll have, we'll have some we'll have some improvements and that's a that's a good thing but it, it won't be eradicated and when you see more organizations like I work for United Way, Greater Toledo, stepping up, making statements that in the past it might have been, well, our campaign dollars, you know, that kind of stuff. But when you see organizations that are willing to step forward, such as that, and some of the bigger ones, the NFL and things like that, when they're starting to use their collective voice, I think that there's, a, there's hope for um, a lot of improvement as we move forward. Yeah. But it won't be eradicated. Right. Ramiko, do you see this as an issue for your generation to address? Yes, I feel like um, it should be an issue for my generation and more generations to come. I feel like this, this conversation should be talked about forever. And um, that I hope the world will change, but when, if it does change, this conversation is still going to have to um, happen for everybody because it's never going to go away. And what does change look like? Is it police reform? Or is it a changing of the heart, the mind? I think change would look like, I like the, the shirt that the young lady just left said, legalize being black. I thought that was kind of interesting. And I think change will look as us as equals. Um, like my son said, I, when I moved in my neighborhood, um, I'm, probably one of, I'm still probably one of the only black homeowners 
where I live and he stays in an area as well that's um, mostly um, white population and so I think change will um, be accept acceptance not feeling like you um, on pins and needles when you come in that you have to prove yourself that you're you're, you're you got to do this and beyond to make sure you're acceptable and that they start mm -hmm. viewing you as okay they're going to be decent people and that kind of thing and so I think change is basically um, not pre preconceived opinions whether you're black or white mm -hmm. preconceived opinions of that individual I think that's what what change will look like accepting the fact that we might do some things different but coming together as human beings whether it be even on a religious level where even though I might worship God different than you and you this that, and the other but collectively as human beings we come together in a space that's positive whether right. you're here and I'm here and I think that's what change looks like just acceptance.